My name is Michael Hecht, and I'm privileged and honored uh, to bring this program to you today. Uh, Dr. King is definitely one of my central heroes. I'm an old hippie from the 60s. I've done artwork in the past for the Black Panthers. I met many of the historical people from the 60s that are now in our history books. I did recently, not recently, but years ago, I did the poster for the Million Man March uh, for the NAACP in Denver. Um, and Dr. King has been a central part of enriching my life. And uh, through the years, you know, each decade you learn, you bring something else. And when I look back at Dr. King 20 years ago, I was able to bring in my 40s a greater understanding of who he was. Uh, being a, a father and a husband, and then realizing the man that we don't see really depicted on TV or in films, but this was a man who took the mantle of the civil rights basically because he came home one night and his daughter asked daddy, I just saw a commercial for an amusement park. Can we go there? And when can we go there? And Dr. King had to sit his daughter down and tell her that at that point they couldn't go there because they were black. And he went in later on to Coretta who grew up with a sharecropper's family, had known poverty. Dr. King was blessed in a middle-class family and he was also given an opportunity to teach at Howard University for 100,000 a year. And he was very unsure of taking the mantle of the civil rights until he had this night and had to tell his daughter that they couldn't go. And he told Coretta, this is not about us. This is about our children and our children's children. And therefore, he, one of the leading factors in taking the mantle of the civil rights movement. His heroes, even during college and early on, were Henry David Thoreau, but probably the most important person for his philosophy was Mahatma Gandhi and the peaceful revolution in India against Britain. Once he took the mantle, he always had premonitions of death. And we have to remember that he knew and Coretta knew, unfortunately, turbulent times, that if he took the mantle, there was a good chance he wouldn't take his children to high school or college or even earlier on. He would never see them possibly marry, have grandchildren. We have to understand that as adults. Um, you know, when we learn sometimes about King in public school, we're too young to understand all that. So how did we get Dr. King? And I always talk to people that it also relates to art. And they asked Harold Allen one time, how did you write Somewhere Over the Rainbow? And he gave a wise guy answer. Oh, I was out to dinner with my wife and I wrote it down on a napkin. And by then, in my own personal opinion, it's not like, like that. It's like a flower. I mean, human beings are like flowers. You got to water them, take care of them, and then they blossom. Okay. And what goes into that water? Harold Allen, he got letters from families in Germany. And this is as the Nazis are starting to gain power. And if you go back and look at somewhere over the rainbow, you'll realize that he's really talking about what's going on in Nazi Germany. But with King, there were other factors that made him. And let's go back to his own words and his own recollections about what really watered his flower. The making of the fire inside of him. Dr. King was taken by his father to get shoes. And Dr. King writes, 
The clerk came over, they walked in, and my father said, let's sit down and I'll go get some shoes and let's start trying them on. And as they were trying on shoes, this is what happens. I'll be happy to wait on you if you'll just move to those seats in the rear of the store. My dad immediately retorted, there's nothing wrong with these seats. We're quite comfortable here. Sorry, said the clerk, but you'll have to move. We'll either buy shoes sitting there, my father retorted, or we won't buy shoes at all. Whereupon he took me by the hand and walked out of the store. This was the first time I had seen dad so furious. That experience revealed to me at a very early age that my father had not adjusted to the system and he played a great part in shaping my conscience. I still remember walking down the street beside him as he muttered, I, I don't care how long I have to live with this system, I will never accept it. And he never has. I remember riding with him another day when he accidentally drove past the stop sign. A policeman pulled up to the car and said, all right, boy, pull over and let me see your license. My father instantly retorted, let me make it clear to you that you aren't talking to a boy. If you persist in referring to me as boy, I will be forced to act as if I don't hear a word you are saying. The policeman was so shocked in hearing a Negro talk to him so forthrightly that he didn't quite know how to respond. He nervously wrote the ticket and left the scene as quickly as possible. Dr. King Jr. continues. There was a pretty strict system of segregation in Atlanta. For a long, long time, I could not go swimming until there was a Negro YMCA. A Negro child in Atlanta could not go to any public park. I could not go to the so-called white schools. In many of the stores downtown, I couldn't go to a lunch counter to buy a hamburger or a cup of coffee. I could not attend any of the theaters. There were one or two Negro theaters, but they didn't get any of the main pictures. If they did get them, they got them two or three years later. I remember another experience I used to have in Atlanta. I went to high school on the other side of town to the Booker T. Washington High School. I had to get the bus in what was known as the Fourth Ward and ride over to the west side. In those days, rigid patterns of segregation existed on the buses so that Negroes had to sit in the backs of buses. Whites were seated in the front and often if whites didn't get on the buses, those seats were still reserved for whites only. So Negroes had to stand over empty seats. I would end up having to go to the back of that bus with my body. But every time I got on that bus, I left my mind up on the front seat. And I said to myself, one of these days, I'm going to put my body up, up there where my mind is. And the watering of this flower continues. Dr. King continues, when I was 14, I traveled from Atlanta to Dublin, Georgia with a dear teacher of mine, Mrs. Bradley. I participated in an oratorical contest there and I succeeded in winning the contest. My subject, ironically enough, was the Negro in the Constitution. That night, Mrs. Bradley and I were on a bus returning to Atlanta. Along the way, some white passengers boarded the bus and the white driver ordered us to get up and give the whites our seats. We didn't move quickly enough to suit him, so he began cursing us. I intended to stay right in that, that seat, but Mrs. Bradley urged me up saying we had to obey the law. We stood up in the aisle for 90 miles to Atlanta. That night will never leave my memory. It was the angriest I have ever been in my life. This is quoted in the New York Times, February 24th, 1956, Dr. King Jr. There are those who would try to make of this a hate campaign. This is not war between the white and the Negro, but a conflict between justice and injustice. 
This is bigger than the Negro race revolting against the white. We are seeking to improve not the Negro of Montgomery, but the whole of Montgomery. If we are arrested every day, if we are exploited every day, if we are trampled over every day, don't ever let anyone pull you so low as to hate them. We must use the weapon of love. We must have compassion and understanding for those who hate us. We must realize so many people are taught to hate us that they are not totally responsible for their hate. But we stand in life at midnight. We are always on the threshold of a new dawn. February 24th, 1956. This was a statement he made in 1963 at the 16th Street Baptist Church. The reason I can't follow the old eye for an eye philosophy is that it ends up leaving everybody blind. Somebody must have sense and somebody must have religion. And just to interrupt for a second, um, I work at the Stoughton Retirement Services, specifically in our memory care unit. Um, but these programs over the last 20 years have been presented uh, to the elders as well. But this particular excerpt, I always think of almost every morning when I'm driving to work and it's 5.30 and it's dark. And of course, you get a numerous cars coming at you with their brights on. And then the day I read this excerpt is I never forgot it. And I always think of Dr. King Jr. I remember some years ago, my brother and I were driving from Atlanta to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And for some reason, the drivers that night were very discourteous or they were forgetting to dim their lights. And finally, my brother looked over at me and he said, Martin, I'm tired of this now. And the next car that comes by here and refuses to dim the lights, I'm going to refuse to dim mine. And I said to my brother, wait a minute, don't do that. Somebody has to have some sense on this highway. And if somebody doesn't have sense enough to dim the lights, we'll all end up destroyed on this highway. And I'm saying the same thing for us here in Birmingham. We are moving up a mighty highway to the city of freedom. There will be meandering points. There will be curves and difficult moments. And we will be tempted to retaliate with the same kind of force that the opposition will use. But I'm going to say to you, wait a minute, Birmingham. Somebody's got to have some sense in Birmingham. May 3rd, 1963. The next is probably the pivotal episode to triggering finally a movement for civil rights. And that's the episode with Miss Rosa Parks. And this is from the book, uh, Jim Bishop. And he writes about that specific moment. The driver looked. All the seats were filled. A few whites stood up front. All right, all right, he said, looking at Mrs. Parks and two blacks. Come on, get in the back. Rosa Parks looked up at the strong white man at her side, waiting. Three blacks got up and walked to the back. Get out of that seat, the driver said, pointing at Mrs. Parks. All he saw was a small dark woman with a circlet of braids and a glint of light from her glasses. No, she said, I won't. Rosa Parks was not frightened. She had been secretary of the local NAACP chapter for years, and she was attuned to race relations and knew the difference between the loud and the ominous. This threat was ominous. Conversely, the bus driver seemed to understand that this black woman was one who was going to sit there just to defy him. So he yanked the rat on the emergency brake, ducked under the steel bar, and left to look for a policeman. Suddenly, the chatter on the bus stopped. All the birds, dark and light inside that bus, fell silent. They knew what he had said. They knew what she had said. There was seldom a confrontation, except once in a while, between an intoxicated Negro and a surly driver. This was different an apparently gentle person, one who might wear gloves as a habit, had given the driver a flat no. 
and there was nothing he could do except call a policeman. If the word got around Montgomery that a small woman has successfully defied a big white brute of a man on the Cleveland Avenue bus, well, this would not be December 1st, 1955. It would be a hallelujah day all over the city. September 15, 1963, Birmingham. A bomb goes off in the Baptist church and four young African-American girls are killed. And Dr. King Jr. comes down to Birmingham and he gives the eulogy. And I wanted to read an excerpt. So in spite of the darkness of this hour, we must not despair. We must not become bitter, nor must we harbor the desire to retaliate with violence. We must not lose faith in our white brothers. Somehow we must believe that the most misguided among them can learn to respect the dignity and worth of all human personality. May I now say a word to you, the members of the bereaved families. It is almost impossible possible to say anything that can console you at this difficult hour and remove the deep clouds of disappointment which are floating in your mental skies. But I hope you can find a little consolation from the universality of this experience. Death comes to every individual. There is an amazing democracy about death. It is not an aristocracy for some of the people, but a democracy for all of the people. Kings die and beggars die. Rich men die and poor men die. Old people die and young people die. Death comes to the innocent and it comes to the guilty. Death is the irreducible common denominator of all men. I hope you can find some consolation from Christianity's affirmation that death is not the end. Death is not a period ends the great sentence of life, but a comma that punctuates it to more lofty significance. Death is not a blind alley that leads the human race into a state of nothingness, but an open door which leads man into life eternal. Let this daring faith, this great invincible surmise be your sustaining power during these trying days. Dr. King Jr. There's an experience in New York City that gives birth to one of his great speeches. And he was doing a book signing in Manhattan. Again, from the days of Martin Luther King Jr. by Jim Bishop. He looked up from a book and grinned, yes, I am, Dr. King. The expression on the woman's face changed swiftly. You son of a gun, she screamed and took a long Japanese letter opener from her purse. Luther King, she shouted, I've been after you for years. The blade came down hard, tore through the white shirt and into his ribs until only the handle was sticking from his chest. Martin Luther King sat quietly knowing what danger there was in moving. The others waiting in line began to scream. His attacker ran for the front door but was stopped by employees. Another woman shrieking hysterically tried to pull the letter opener from Dr. King's chest. He turned pleading eyes on her, motioning her not to do it. A store employee slowly removed the woman's hand from the blade. Someone phoned Harlem Hospital for an ambulance. A black photographer snapped in a flashbulb and caught a shot of King with the letter opener buried deep in his chest. At the hospital, Dr. Emil A. Nasalara and two other surgeons noted that the wound was deep and in a dangerous area of the chest. They did not touch the letter opener. The shirt and underwear were cut by surgical scissors around the weapon. King was conscious, but in shock. If this was to be the end of his life, and he must have weighed the possibility, he did not cringe from it. Breathing was difficult, but he obeyed the doctor's injunctions to take little ones.
the doctor and his assistants were in all likelihood more frightened than Dr. King. They realized that since the point of the dagger had missed the heart, if he sneezed, it would mean sudden death. An operating room was prepared. The mere taking of x-rays required caution. His fear became fact. The point of the blade was leaning against the outer wall of the aorta, the huge vessel, vessel which carries blood from the heart to the rest of the body. A cough and Dr. King Jr.'s sudden movement could kill him. The operation required three hours of delicate work. The little dent in the aorta was cleared. King was examined for lung puncture. Under the diffusing beams of an overhead light, he was sutured and sent to a private room. He would live. I want to talk as we come closer to our closing of the program. I want to come to Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. King Jr was asked by the sanitation workers to come down and support their mission for a race. And uh, un unfortunately, he never had a good feel about Memphis. Throughout his tenure as the civil rights leader, is he always had a premonition he would be killed. And in fact, People that were close to him said that if a car backfired, if someone dropped a pane of glass, if someone maybe hit a book too hard in church in demonstration of go on Dr. King Jr. He would have a moment of thinking he was shot. In fact, in many of his marches, there were times when he doubled over when there was such a, a loud, crack. He decides to give a speech in Memphis at the church. And what happens is this. During the day, they marched in Memphis in support of the sanitation workers. And unfortunately, there was a scuffle. People were injured between the police and some of the marches. Now, I can't emphasize enough, Dr. King Jr was all about peace, all about nonviolence. This really rocked them. Uh, they got back to the Memphis hotel and he said, Dr. Abernathy, I can't do the talk. You're gonna have to go. And Ralph Abernathy and Dr. King were like brothers. And Ralph said that he knew when Dr. King or Martin said to him, I can't do something or you have to do it for me. There was really no point in pushing the man. So I want you to think about Dr. King Jr. in a rumpled trench coat in the same clothes he wore during the day. And Ralph Abernathy leaves the hotel room, takes a taxi and starts to make his way to the church. And as he gets closer, there are hundreds and hundreds of people in the streets leading up to the church. It's pouring rain, pouring rain. And as he gets closer to the church, he realizes there was no more room in the church. And what happens is they put speakers up on the roof of the church so the people outside could hear Dr. King. And he goes to the nearest phone, and he calls up the motel room. He says, Martin, you have to come. The people did not come to hear me. They came to hear you. You have to come. And now the reverse happens. Martin knew that when Ralph said something like that, it was important enough for him to gather himself and go. And Dr. King gets in a taxi, makes the same journey and he gets to the church and he opens the doors that lead into the church and then lead down the center aisle and as he walks down the center aisle dr king the people in the pews start to crowd each other until they can get as close as they can 
to the center aisle. And as Dr. King walks towards the altar, the people in the pews put out their hands because they just want to touch him. And this is what he says. There's an excerpt. They allowed me to read some of the mail that came in when I was in the hospital. And from all over the states and the world, kind letters came in. I read a few, but one of them I will never forget. I had received one from the president and the vice president. I've forgotten what those telegrams said. I received a visit and a letter from the governor of New York, but I've forgotten what that letter said. But there was another letter that came from a little girl, a young girl who was a student at the White Plains High School. And I looked at the letter and I'll never forget it. It said simply, dear Dr. King, I am a ninth grade student at the White Plains High School, she said. Well, it should not matter. I would like to mention that I'm a white girl. I read in the paper of your misfortune and of your suffering. And I read that if you had sneezed, you would have died. And I'm simply writing to you to say that I'm so happy that you didn't sneeze. I want to say that I too am happy that I didn't sneeze because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960 when students all over the South started sitting in at lunch counters. And I knew that as they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best in the American dream. And taking the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy, which were dug deep by the founding fathers and the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1961 when we decided to take a ride for freedom and ended segregation in interstate travel. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1962 when Negroes in Albany, Georgia decided to straighten their backs up. And whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they are going somewhere because a man can't ride your back unless it is bent. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been here in 1963 when the people of Birmingham, Alabama aroused the conscience of this nation and brought into being the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have had a chance later that August to try to tell America about a dream that I had. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been down in Selma, Alabama to see the great movement there. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been in Memphis to see a community rally around those brothers and sisters who are suffering. I'm so happy that I didn't sneeze. I left Atlanta this morning, and as we got started on the plane, there were six of us. The pilot said over the public address system, we are sorry for the delay, but we have Dr. Martin Luther King on the plane. And to be sure that all of the bags were checked, and to be sure that nothing would be wrong on the plane, we had to check out everything carefully. And we've had the plane protected and guarded all night. And then I got into Memphis and some began to say the threats or talk about the threats that were out or what would happen to me from, from some of our sick white brothers. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind, like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I am happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. April 4th, 1968 is the assassination. Coretta King says, we march on Monday and then I'll take my husband home. And they had a successful march in support of the sanitation workers and then she took her husband home. Before I read the closing excerpt, I'd just like to say that uh, with this program, 
um, with all due respect, I'd rather not take any questions. Um, I think it's important to let his words resonate and maybe spend the day remembering some of his words. And this was an excerpt from a drum major from Righteousness. Every now and then, I guess we all think realistically about that day when we will be victimized with what is life's final common denominator. That's something we call death. We all think about it. And every now and then I think about my own death and I think about my own funeral. And I don't think of it in a morbid sense. Every now and then I ask myself, what is it that I would want said? And I leave the words to you this morning. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. And I want you to be able to say that day that I did try in my life to close those who were naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and to serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the final luxurious things of life to leave behind, but I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I wanted to say. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I could cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian art, if I can bring salvation to a world runs wrought, if I could spread the message as the master taught, then my living will not be in vain. Thank you.